Let's Get Down to Business is presented by Bravo, the marketing arm of Ash Brokerage Corporation, the practice enhancement company. All this week, it's the end of the year tax planning for 2013. And on today's show, charitable giving. And with me today is certified financial planner and CPA, Ken Davis. Hi everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and contributing author to Backroom Technician. Let's get down to business. Well, welcome to day four, hey, Ken. Hey, Steven. Uh, part of uh, end of the year planning, we're gonna have to touch on charitable giving. Our Christmas show is gonna be all about charitable giving, a whole series with Dan Nagito. So do you don't wanna forget to, to watch that. It's coming up here in about a week or so. Uh, I really want to touch on this from a deduction point of view and also from charitable intent. Now, when people are looking at considering a gift, and I'm looking at, well, what are some of the things that reasons why? Now, compassion for those in need is the top of the list. People like to give, and I've noticed that we are the most benevolent country in the world. Nobody outgives the United States, whether it's foreign aid, whether it's compassion to help feed the poor, and even in our own country, when you look at charitable giving, it is really sizable. And with the recovery underway now, and we are starting to earn the stock markets back online, and people have recovered from some of the losses, people are turning back to doing end-of-the-year planning, and part of that is charitable giving. Well, and I think that's important, and I can tell you, having been in my Qantas Club years ago, not only raising money for charities, but actually getting out, painting walls and installing mm -hmm. floors, stuff like that, you really get to know the charities one-on-one -on -one and, it, and it makes you feel really good that you're helping so that those are important considerations and of course there's other considerations that businesses you know may be good corporate citizens but they also uh, support their brand by be doing things in the community so charitable giving can be used at a number of levels first to take care of people mm -hmm. second to promote uh, brand awareness and other types of things. So it's an important tool. And of course, tax deductions. Uh, you know, America is one of the most religious countries in the world. People like their religion. They want to see it go on into perpetuity after mm -hmm. they pass. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I like about charitable giving is people like to give. People have money, don't mind doing this, but there's a lot of people that don't have money that have just as much a big heart as anybody else. Their hearts are big, but their wallets are small. So. Here's, uh, this is why we talk about life insurance in tandem with charitable uh, giving because a lot of people have a heart for this. And, a lot of, and if I can look at a second to die contract that can actually give to either to the, to the actual charity or replace it, the gift that you give to the charity, sometimes you can leverage what, you know, for maybe let's say three or $4,000 a year, which is not a lot of money, that could really leverage between a hundred and a half, 200,000, some kind of number like that where people can say, I gave a hundred thousand to the church. Yeah, there, there's two different kinds of givers. There's those that say, I want to give the money today and I want to see it do good things. I want to actually see the benefit of what I've given to the charity in force today. Others say, well, that's great, but this is a wonderful church and, and we've watched our neighborhoods change and sometimes they had kids, sometimes it's older people and mm -hmm. stuff. We want to have a foundation upon which the church can continue on. So we're going to set up an endowment type of a, of a process and that's where life insurance comes in, is that you can put small amounts of money away now and uh, have a very large gift at, at, uh, when you pass away. Now, make sure that if you're going to give, don't just buy a policy and leave the charity as the beneficiary. You don't get a deduction for those premiums. A better alternative is to negotiate with the charity and get it in writing, contract that you're going to give them money. You get a deduction for that. The charity then turns around and buys the life insurance policy with your gift. Now you get a deduction, so do it the right way. It's not just religion, too. I mean, a lot of people like to support, like, the arts, sciences. Animals. Education, animals. I mean, there are so many nonprofit, and that's, I think this is the biggest issue, Ken. It does have to be an approved nonprofit IRS entity, right? I mean, you have to approve this. Yes, it does. And, I, you know, sometimes when I would always ask my clients when we're doing uh, estate planning, do you have a charity you want to leave money to? Frequently, the answer is no. But the fact is there's 20% of, of the very wealthy people over $10 million in, in net worth that are highly motivated to, to give. And so it's, a, it's an important question. Sometimes I dig a little deeper and say, well, is there anything, are, are you really excited about animals or museums or your church or synagogue or whatever your mm -hmm. faith is? Uh, and when I ask it that way, we start to plug into their passions, mm -hmm. then they start to get it. Now, re remember, there's, uh, with estate planning, you get to give away your money to two, two entities. It's either your children to a charity or the government. You mm -hmm. get to pick two of the three. Mm -hmm. and most people, when, when presented that option, will say their charity and their children. Mm -hmm. And so 
Can I add grandchildren into that? Well, yeah, of course. And and the other thing too is uh, where you take money to make your contributions is important. I had a client who was taking money out of his IRA, paying taxes on it, and then paying a contribution to his charities. He was very active in the community. I said, no, 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 no. Would take it out of your capital gain assets. You have tax basis, so you have less taxable. And then what is taxable is taxed at a lower rate. And leave your IRA alone and reallocate your money when you, when you die, because he was making bequests to charities. Give it out of your IRA because there's no income tax and no estate tax if you do it that way. Mm -hmm. If you leave it to your kids, the kids may end up with 30 or 40% of the money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being wise about where you make your contributions from and, and what assets you use uh, is important. And then finally, the, the other thing is take a capital asset and give it to the charity, then have them sell it because they don't pay tax on it, mm -hmm. as opposed to sell it, pay taxes, even though it's at cap gains rates, and then make the So you could take your qualified plan, you could actually make that contribution to the charity as well. Well, at death, you can do mm -hmm. that. The, the, if you take it during life, you have to pay taxes mm -hmm. and then move it over. You can't just give part of your mm -hmm. money. There is, the, I think it's still in effect this year for 70 or 70 and a half. You can roll like $100,000 to a charity. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not up on those rules, but I think mm -hmm. it's still good through the end of this year. I know that a lot of people have a desire to share good, their good fortune with others. And we've just named a few things. And the, the most critical, it has to be IRS approved, nonprofit. You don't want to do all the things that are right. In my view, when we're talking, especially in a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about Christmas, holiday, Hanukkah, all the, the holidays. It's important for us to know that if you have any kind of intent, this could be part of your end of the year planning, and we could really help a lot of our advisors get in front of people that they normally don't get involved with. Right. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk more about charitable giving techniques for the end of the year planning. And don't forget, you can request all the show's documents that we use as sample examples from Backroom Technician at ashbrokerage.com. And you can sign up for your own 30-day free trial offer from Backroom Technician. Just go out to brtnow.com forward slash trial sign up dot ASPX. We'll be right back after the break. Back in the day, life insurance professionals were called field underwriters. Then, carriers trained their field force in the basics of life insurance underwriting. Today, the insurance industry doesn't educate the agent population as they once did. But now, you can have the informed risk guide at your fingertips so you can illustrate a reasonable rate class for your life insurance prospects. Just request your copy of the informed risk guide at downtobusiness.ashbrokerage.com. It's free from Ash Brokerage, the practice enhancement company. Well, welcome back. I'm Steve Savant with Ken Davis. And remember, you can watch all our episodes of Let's Get Down to Business, including my weekly consumer show, Steve Savant's Money, the name of the game, right out at ashbrokerage.com. Just click on the show logo, and it'll put you right to the home page. And just a heads up, before moving forward with any of the ideas on the show, always consult your tax advisor, your legal counsel, as well as your broker-dealer compliance officer. Well, let's get down to business. We're talking about charity Charitable giving. I love that that line in uh, The Christmas Carol, mankind was my business. It should have been my business, right? Well, when we're talking, there's so many ideas. There's people out there using techniques that are excellent. I mean, charitable remainder annuity trust, charitable remainder unit trust, pooled income funds, charitable gift annuities, life insurance gifting. There's all kinds of tactical issues. And we've, you named a few up just before we close out the segment. Walk me through some, a couple of these. And then I know you wanted to bring something else up at the break. Well... One of the nice things, one of the things that I, I, I favor right now is the charitable gift annuity. And the reason is this, just an example. It, let's say you have an 80-year-old woman who's very devout in her particular faith, and she says to her, her minister, gee, I wish I had more money to give you. I just love this church, and it just is so important to me in my life. And the pastor turns to her and says, well, you can. Well, well how can I do that? Well, let's say she has $300,000 in a CD and she takes $100,000 and she buys a charitable gift annuity. And the terms of that are, at 80 years old, the payout on a normal commercial annuity, I don't know, might be 8 or 9% mm -hmm. under the uh, guidelines for a charitable gift annuity, maybe she gets 6%. Well, what happens is she gives the money to the charity, the charity invests it, pays her principal and interest out of what they're investing in at 6% and when she passes away, whatever's ever left goes to the charity, okay? Well, the beauty of that is that she might have been making 1% on the CD, 
and now she's making 6% and she's leaving a legacy or benefit to the charity. And so she now has more income to live on and so she's doing better. And then she may have excess now that she can make contributions in addition to what she leaves them at the end. With these very low interest rate environment, the charitable gift annuity looks very attractive because it's based on their life expectancy, not based on interest rate. So the charity so loves it because they, they get income today and kind of a, a lump sum at death of their parishioner, and, in and, the, your example. And the formulas are generally designed to leave about 50% of the asset to the charity. An alternative is you go out and say you take two thirds of the money and buy a commercial annuity, you know, the, the, the church or the uh, charity could, and use that to pay her for the rest of the life and know that they're gonna have enough money, and then they'll have use the other 30% and spend it now. So, you know, there are alternatives to doing this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's advantages between a remainder annuity trust versus this kind of a gift annuity? Well, when you get into charitable remainder trust, you're talking about a customized document. And of course, the customized document always allows you to do more of what you want to do. But now you have to pay an attorney, you have to pay an accountant, you have an investment mm -hmm. advisor. Uh, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do charitable remainder trust unless you have a whole lot of money that you're able to give. Let's say mm -hmm. somebody's got $10 million in assets and they want to give a couple million to a trust. Well. That might make some sense when all those expenses are, are considered and the control they have. The other thing is we didn't worry about this so much uh, in low tax rates, but it's now becoming important again. If you have a highly appreciated asset, you can contribute it to your own charitable remainder trust with and, and get a partial tax deduction, uh, then live off the income for the rest of your life, so it's very much like the gift annuity. Uh, and then at death, it goes to the uh, charity. Well, I remember when our tax rates were really high, uh, avoiding the taxation on the conversion uh, allowed for a lot more money to be invested. And so the numbers really looked good. Well, we went away from that because the numbers didn't look so hot. Mm -hmm. uh, but a big deal is taking an appreciated asset, contributing it. Because the charitable remainder trust is essentially a charity, they can sell it without any tax taxation reinvest it and then pay you the income. What happens though when the beneficiaries, the, you know, mom and dad are cool with this, but the beneficiaries are saying, hey, you just, you just gave away some of my inheritance here to the charity. Well, that's where our opportunities advisor comes in with life insurance is you take part of this excess income that you're now getting. Say you had a piece of raw land that mm -hmm. paid no income. Now they've converted it <clears throat> through the CRT. It's reinvested in income bearing types of assets and you did it without paying taxes. Now you're getting this income well, you're going to have some excess income that you wouldn't have gotten. Take part of that for a number of years, maybe a 10-year premium, for instance. Buy a life insurance policy in an irrevocable life insurance trust so that, yes, this asset goes away, it goes to the charity, but it reappears as tax-free assets in the hands of the children uh, when you die. So uh, you have to crunch the numbers. There's periods of time when tax rates are high enough, where the wealth is high enough where this whole concept of a charitable remainder trust makes a whole lot of sense. This is a pretty heavy uh, psychological issue for the beneficiaries too because mom and dad do want to bless the charity but they don't want to have a kind of a, um, a bitter taste in their children's mouths or their mm -hmm. grandchildren's mm -hmm. mouths. There is legacy planning that sometimes looks like charity because a, the, a, com a, a couple may invent their own or actually create a foundation where their kids can actually work in that foundation, maybe they're part of that. Do you see much of that going on right now? Well, again, this is for wealthier clients, mm -hmm. and a, a private uh, foundation can be a great planning tool, but again, it's expensive and sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Allows you to leave the money when you die from the Charitable Remainder Trust to your own private foundation. The kids run it. They can get plane fares. They can run all over the country. They get recognition for it. it, it, it it's for the wealthy, really wealthy types of folks. Well, that's our show for today. Remember, you can read all my online insurance commentary, advisor blogs, and articles on Producers Web, and my answers to consumer questions on the Insurance Library. Don't forget to view all of our past episodes of any of our shows on our on-demand section located at downtobusiness.hashbrokerage.com. So you'll follow me at Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, or just email me, steve.savant at ashbrokerage.com. And remember, you could be wiser as an Ash Brokerage advisor. I'm Steve Savant. See you tomorrow.